And we are live. Hello, my name is Martha Ellis and I am the Executive Director for the Public Safety Broadband Technology Association or the PSBTA. I'd like to welcome you to the PSBTA's Technical Solution Webinar Series. Our mission as an association is to work as end user advocates for all first responders and service providers who support response mitigation and recovery efforts during emergencies. We want you to have the most current and accurate information available to you so you can develop your wireless connectivity plan. Additionally, we advocate for you and your perspective and ideas. We all have a part in how our wireless future evolves to meet the first responders needs. What's important to us today is that by the end of this webinar, you have a clear understanding that there is an amazing wireless network available just to you and with the right tools, connecting can be seamless. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. All attendees have automatically been muted to uh, reduce background noise. Any questions should be submitted directly to us through the questions function, which is located at the bottom of the menu on the right side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation and we will attempt to get to as many questions as possible, but still stay within our allotted hour. We will follow up with any questions that we're unable to get to during the live portion of the webinar after we finish up today. Should you have any further questions when the webinar is over, we will also provide emails for the presenters at the end so you can follow up at your convenience. That being said, our first webinar topic is of particular importance in our current and continually changing emergency response world. As the commercial broadband networks continue to bow under the strain of increased use and higher data demands, it's important that all frontline first responders to, COVID to the COVID-19 emergency and frankly, all other emergencies that continue to come in, uh, know and understand the mobile network options available exclusively to them. The PSBTA has some incredible vendor partners, and today we're going to hear from Donna Johnson, Vice President at CradlePoint, who will discuss what it means to take your network with you and how CradlePoint devices can streamline the process. We also have Abacar Gonzalez, Enterprise Manager with FirstNet built with AT&T, who will explain the primary differences between FirstNet, which incidentally is the nation's only fully dedicated mission critical first responders network and commercial wireless offerings. It's important to understand and our current circumstances clearly demonstrate, emergencies can shift the front line of response from the streets directly into our emergency rooms and sometimes parking lots, vacant buildings and Navy ships. The demands put on our emergency response and mitigation teams across this country require agility and ingenuity in preserving the communications and connectivity for our first responders. The good news is there are tools available that will allow you to rise above the congestion and enable you to get the work done. With that, I will turn the time over to Avacar to begin our webinar on the COVID-19 response, rapidly deployable networks for healthcare. Thank you very much, Martha. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to uh, get into the importance of FirstNet and how we're helping our first responders, especially during this particular pandemic that's happening as we speak. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so as uh, Martha mentioned, FirstNet is the broadband uh, nationwide public safety broadband network that's exclusive to our first responders and those that support them. It's more than a network in the sense that it provides a dedicated communications platform for our first responders that does not interfere with the usage of our commercial users that are out there as well. Next slide. Now, this partnership between FirstNet and the uh, FirstNet Network Authority, which is the federal government, is the it's a 25-year public-private partnership. It's the uh, the most significant of its kind. Uh, some of the things that at and brought to the table that made it a clear-cut favorite to uh, receive the award of this RFP was the fact that we offered our existing network infrastructure, which included over $180 billion of network assets, and we included the network and the uh, technology and innovation advancements and professionals that are actually accustomed to building out a network. The uh, FirstNet Network Authority provided 20 megahertz of spectrum known as Band 14, which is exclusive spectrum available to our first responders and uh, obviously provides much better communication for our first responders to utilize. 
What made us really stand out, as I mentioned, with regards to the network assets already in place, is the fact that we did not just say, we're going to build out this spectrum, this band 14 network for you. We're also going to provide access to our existing network, which include all AT&T LTE bands, in addition to band 14. We could move on to the next slide. Now, a quick timeline of events. So in 2012, the first, net, the first responder network authority, again, uh, backed by the federal government, authorized, the development, uh, authorized to develop and oversee a dedicated nationwide network for first responders. It was the first and only of its kind. It still is to this date. On March of 2017, AT&T was awarded the contract to build and maintain FirstNet. As I mentioned prior, FirstNet is not a matter of simply building out band 14, which was the expectation by the network authority to build out this network over the next five years. We opened up all of our AT&T LTE bands to make sure that our first responders were able to gain priority on the network, regardless of what particular network tower they were pointed at. As of uh, March of 2018, we also completed the, uh, the uh, private core, which again, segregates traffic from our commercial users and our first responders utilizing the FirstNet network. So that was one of the key RFP requirements. We had to build a completely physically separated core, which would be secure and redundant and exclusive to FirstNet users. That means that your network traffic, whether it be a phone call, a text message, or a data session does not get intermingled with our commercial users on the AT&T platform. You're on your own physically separated core. This is not a virtual separation that occurs within the same network. It's physically a separate network built solely for the use of our first responders. Um, as of December of 2019, we hit our first, our 1 million connections. And we can go on to the next slide just to kind of discuss a few of the milestones here. But um, again, why FirstNet? So again, no throttling on the network. That's again, one of the key RFP requirements. So we made sure that there was no throttling, no slowing down of the data on the uh, FirstNet network. Throttling is a very common um, network uh, rule that takes place on our commercial side and takes place in any other carriers network. Whenever any particular user is utilizing a certain amount of data in a particular area, they are slowed down or throttled to, uh, to slower network speeds during that data session. On the first net network, there are network algorithms that do not allow such characteristics to take place. So there is no throttling on the first net network anywhere in the country. As I mentioned prior, it is the only physically separated network that's dedicated just to our first responders and those that support them. One of the uh, key terms that you'll hear through this presentation is known as preemption and priority. Priority on the network means that you will always gain first access to any network tower. So whether that's on a band 14 network, which is being built for our first responders, or if that's on a traditional AT&T LTE network, you'll always gain first priority on that network tower above any of our commercial users. Preemption is critical, especially during the times that we're experiencing right now. Preemption means that anytime we've got congestion on the network, we can physically move our non-FirstNet users off the network in order to make space for you to prioritize your communications and handle your data sessions. So preemption is key because if there's ever any congestion issues, we're able to move those other users that are not essential to non-Band 14 and non-FirstNet communications to make sure that our first responders are able to communicate. Band 14 Spectrum, as I mentioned, we are now live in about 675 markets and continuing to improve on that number. Uh, we were given five years from uh, 2018 to complete the build out of Band 14. We are well ahead of schedule, about to hit 80% build out of this Band 14 Spectrum. And as I mentioned, it's, only, uh, it's pretty much complementary to the fact that we've got a very redundant network already in place, but it is dedicated to our first responders, which is key. The other piece is, we can actually go on to our next slide as we get into some of the, uh, the key milestones there too. So we've now hit over 1.2 million connections 
And that doesn't count the month of March where we obviously experienced the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot more of our users obviously wanted to make sure that they were uh, well connected and, and, and prepared to have the, uh, the influx of, of traffic within their, their healthcare departments. So we've got over 1.2 million connections already on FirstNet that has probably increased by another 100,000 over the last month. We uh, also have over 11,000 public safety agencies that are utilizing FirstNet today. The uh, network has been recognized as a faster network than any other commercial network out there, including AT&T. So uh, it was finally recognized by UCLA, which is a third party uh, network uh, uh, tester or vendor that uh, measures network speeds. Uh, FirstNet was recognized as its own separate network and the uh, test showed that we were a much faster network than any commercial carrier out there, as I mentioned, including AT&T. Um, we're also gonna talk about deployables today. So we've got uh, 76 deployables, which are put in place to restore network in case of a natural disaster. We've obviously experienced a few natural disasters recently, and we've deployed some of these assets. So I'll quickly get into that as well. And as I mentioned, the band 14 coverage is over 75%. We're actually about to hit 80% by the end of uh, this month nationwide. So uh, again, just continuing to increase the coverage specifically in those rural areas and those, um, those areas where traditionally AT&T would not have built towers. A, uh, the point of view from a FirstNet perspective is based on what our first responders are asking for and where they need coverage in order to communicate. Next slide. So as I mentioned, these deployables are key and they're afforded to our FirstNet customers at no cost at all. So the deployables that we utilize come in different forms and fashions. We've got cell on wheels, which are essentially trucks that roll out whenever we need to restore network in a particular area or where we need to create a network presence that did not exist before. We also have aerial um, cell on wings and an aerostat, which is basically a blimp. So uh, these aerial cell, cover, cell sites essentially provide coverage in an area where we cannot get our wheeled assets and we can still restore the network for our users within that area using either our blimp or utilizing our drones. We've got, again, 76 of these uh, assets dedicated to FirstNet. These are utilized during times of emergencies, during times of uh, unexpected congestion, and during planned events. So a planned event can go anywhere from a natural disaster that we see on the weather forecast or that we, uh, that we see by working with our engineers, working with our weather team and things of that nature, we can always foresee uh, particular natural disasters coming in. So we strategically place these assets at the uh, scene or on site to uh, prepare for our first responders to have communications. Furthermore, whenever we cannot roll these sites in there, we can obviously, like I mentioned, uh, provide the aerial uh, coverage as well. Uh, what changed, since FirstNet is the fact that prior to us having this FirstNet agreement, we were basically standing behind that yellow tape and waiting for first responders to give us the green light to go and restore network along with our neighboring carriers. Now, as part of FirstNet, we're in the front lines going ahead of time or with those first responders to go and get the network established before the disaster actually occurs. So it's a, it's a very different dynamic that we've experienced because of the fact that we have um, federal or government level accountability and we have to provide 99.99% coverage reliability by the time band 14 is completely built. Furthermore, we have to make sure that these assets are rolled out within a 14 hour SLA if a network tower or a network area is compromised due, due to a particular event. Next slide. So I'd like to quickly get into how all of our FirstNet users are connected during a crisis. So an incident takes place and we have what are known as primary users. Primary users would consist of fire departments, law enforcement, EMS, EMTs, trauma centers within a hospital. Those are all your frontline first responders that are obviously at the very front end of an incident taking place or an emergency. Now, they don't usually handle incidents on their own. They have support response or extended primary users, which also play a key role when it comes to resolving an incident or an emergency. 
We've got the actual hospitals that these trauma centers are in. We've got utilities, we have transportation, we've got uh, any other critical infrastructure that's required to help resolve that particular incident. Those are known as our extended primary users on the first net network. Both are still above commercial users, and I'll quickly show you a graphic on that on the, in a couple of slides, but more importantly, they're all involved when it comes to resolving an incident. Next slide. So when we look at the ecosystem of healthcare eligibility, we take a look at, again, we talked about our primary users, which include fire, police, EMS, 911, anything within the ambulance or the trauma center. So anything that you picture within that emergency department is considered primary on the first net network. That means that they're prioritized 24 seven and they also get preemptive services whenever there's congestion automatically. Our extended primary users may not need that level of priority at all times, but they can always be called upon to have those communication methods available. An extended primary user would consist of IT critical infrastructure, uh, clinical departments, clinicians, any type of floor devices within a hospital or any type of uh, business offices that consist of administration, uh, crisis preparation, the C-suite or executive level, uh, things of that nature will consist of your extended primary uh, group of users within the first net network. Now on the next slide, I want to quickly show you a graphic of how these different user types um, interact with regards to the network operations. So on a normal day on our band 14 spectrum, you can see that our primary users, meaning law enforcement, trauma center, any devices within those departments, they're on a primary lane on the, uh, on the fast lane here on the left side. You've got your extended primary users that are, again, something to quickly point out, they're above commercial users. So at all times, by default, any extended primary users on the first net network are gaining services above our commercial or our civilians that are on the network as well. But when congestion allows and when the uh, network traffic permits, our commercial users are also able to leverage coverage in areas that was, were potentially not available before. Next slide. So as a crisis occurs, you'll notice that, a, uh, that more of those primary users come into play and we're able to notice that, um, oh, just lost the screen on my side here. Uh, Donna, I'm seeing the, uh, the public safety. So as we get this, uh, get it back up and running, um, again, with regards to primary and extended primary users at all times, they're above our commercial users. But when it comes to a congestion or a very busy time on our network, those commercial users are potentially moved off the network altogether in order to make sure that we've got space for our first responders to communicate. And that's key because that's different than what would happen in the past. And, and think about how, how FirstNet even came about. So FirstNet came about through uh, the events of 9-11 where multiple agencies were involved in helping resolve an incident, but they could not communicate with one another. There was congestion on the network. There was no network available and uh, communications were obviously um, compromised during that unfortunate event. So the purpose of FirstNet is to make sure that at any given time, if there is congestion on the network, we are able to get our first responders the ability to communicate, not just for voice calls, but also for text and for data sessions. Um, as Martha mentioned at, at the beginning of the call, data has become more and more critical as time has gone on. Uh, less and less people are actually making voice calls and more utilizing data and data-centric applications in order to fulfill emergency communications and emergency needs. So it was, it was critical that this network was a uh, purpose-built network that could also handle uh, data speeds and files and uh, data traffic, and that that was also prioritized and preemptive whenever there was an incident taking place or whenever our first responders needed to communicate. Okay. 
Hey, I'll quickly just uh, go through some key advantages as we get the uh, the slide back up. Um, so again, just looking at uh, how FirstNet plays a key role with regards to uh, to communications. So it's a secure network with priority and preemption. So again, on the FirstNet network, you gain uh, priority, which allows you to connect to that network first. No, oh, I'm seeing the screen. I think we're back. Uh, we can go on to the following slide there. One more. There we go. So uh, some of the key advantages. Oh, back. There we go. Um, priority on the network, which allows the uh, first connection. And uh, again, it puts us above any of those civilians or any of those commercial users. Preemption, which allows us to move those users off the network altogether and uh, create space for those users on the first net network to communicate. 99.99% availability. So that's key because again, with this first net partnership with the federal government, it changes the point of view from an AT&T enterprise aspect. So traditionally, it would be more of a revenue question whether or not we would build a tower or build a network in particular areas. The dynamic completely changes when we're serving first responders and public safety. So 99.99% availability is actually part of our contract with the federal government throughout this 25 year contract. So we have to make sure that we provide coverage and we're covering all of our uh, population with the advantages of band 14. Number three, advanced and augmented coverage. So that band 14 spectrum that we received as part of this agreement allows, it, it, it operates on what's known as 700 megahertz, which allows for much better in-building penetration and propagates much farther than traditional LTE bands. So that means that the network is able to reach farther for those users on FirstNet, and it's able to gain much better in-building coverage whenever our first responders are, uh, are on-prem. Uh, no data throttling, as I mentioned, this is critical, especially with the influx of data usage out there, especially in healthcare. There's a lot more applications, a lot more um, uh, patient monitoring and uh, patient charting and patient data that's being transmitted through uh, data sessions. So no data throttling is critical on our unlimited plans. Um, improved communication through interoperability. So this applies uh, twofold. The first piece is allowing interoperability within a hospital or within healthcare. That means internal interoperability where your security staff can communicate with your IT department, can communicate with your clinicians or your doctors in the hospital, and can communicate with the C-suite or the executive staff as well, all through different functions and different channels, even if one of those users is holding a physical radio and the other user is holding a smartphone. We can create an interoperability environment so that everybody is able to communicate on the first net network, regardless of the type of device that they're holding. And then there's external interoperability, which means that, again, going back to 9-11 and going back to the importance of having a universal network for our first responders, we need to make sure that our first responders are able to communicate with one another. So as an incident takes place, we need to make sure that the hospital can communicate with the utility company and they're able to communicate with the fire department and with law enforcement. All through, again, similar aspects with regards to radio, to smartphone communications, and overall a network that's available to them and does not have the interference of those commercial or those civilian users. And then the last piece is affordable rate plans. So making sure that these rate plans are not looking to uh, gain any type of profitability. Now we are a for-profit company and we obviously need to make sure that there are uh, there is adoption in order to ensure that we have um, our first responders on the same network. But more importantly, the rate plans are extremely competitive. They're negotiated at a state level and they're afforded to our enterprise clients as well, which include our hospitals and our healthcare professionals. Uh, next slide. Now, during this pandemic, we've seen uh, uh, kind of the top 10 use cases that we've utilized uh, during COVID-19. So Cradle Point routers, we'll get into a few of those as well, but Cradle Point routers have really played a uh, instrumental part, especially with the pop-up tents and the off-prem uh, healthcare centers that we've established and we've helped stand up from a data a connectivity perspective. Uh, mobile hotspots and, um, and just overall uh, uh, scale bandwidth for remote workers, that's allowed our healthcare uh, systems and our healthcare clients to transition their employees to work from home and still have a secure connection. 
um, in order to perform their, their job responsibilities. Um, we've uh, outsourced the uh, satellite phones and connectivity where we have satellite backup connections available as well, especially again for these areas where we are standing up um, temporary clinics and temporary hospitals uh, during this pandemic. We've also enabled telemedicine visits with collaboration tools. So uh, we've got some tools and some solutions that involve telemedicine where a uh, doctor can remotely uh, see a patient. So uh, just some of the quick use cases, uh, kind of the 10 ways that we're uh, able to help during this pandemic. Next slide. So just to get into detail as to um, one of these solutions. So this is the rapid deployment kit. Uh, this kit allows, this has a built-in cradle point router within the kit that obviously allows for data connectivity. It also comes uh, pre-built with four Sonom devices. These Sonom devices are rugged devices that can actually be uh, bleached and cleaned. The entire kit can actually be uh, bleached completely and reused in order to make sure that it meets the, uh, the, the necessary um, hygiene requirements with regards to the situation that we're in. Um, this kit also allows for satellite connectivity as well. Um, it provides satellite data and satellite voice connection in case there is no network available in that particular area. But essentially, it puts one of those deployable assets that I mentioned a few slides prior in the management and control of the client. So you're able to have one of these kits where you have a cradle point for data, you've got four phones already built into the kit that can be utilized and handed out, and you've got a device that's in a rugged case that can basically give you all of those options in, in one wheeled scenario here. Um, next slide. The uh, next solution is known as a mobile broadband kit or an MBK. Now this has been one of the more popular solutions. Uh, again, these all utilize cradle point routers within the kits. We've been utilizing these at these uh, triage facilities. I, I myself am based out of New York and we utilize these kits at the Javits Center where we stood up a uh, Again, pretty much a temporary hospital. Uh, we also utilize these in Central Park of New York City, where uh, one of our clients, Mount Sinai, uh, stood up uh, some tents to, uh, to provide services and COVID-19 testing. So these kits, again, come with a cradle point router for data connectivity, come with the uh, necessary antennas, its own power supply as well. The main differentiator with this kit and the RDK that I just mentioned is that it does not provide the satellite backup connectivity and does not have the smartphones built into the case as well. So this would be uh, traditionally more like a network failover solution that's mobile and compact with all the components already built in. But in this particular case, it's a, uh, it's a very uh, robust solution to uh, standing up a network. And again, relies on the, uh, on the features and benefits of a cradle point router that's built into the case itself. Next slide. So, Again, at a high level, just uh, some of the feedback and the use cases that we're utilizing out there uh, as we combine FirstNet with healthcare. So again, we mentioned the triage and the testing facility. So through COVID-19, we've worked with a lot of our clients to get them back up and running from a data connective, uh, connectivity perspective and making sure that they have all of their communication needs during the uh, patient surge planning. So many of these sites are not being set up just for COVID-19 testing but they're also being set up to, uh, to solve for patient overflow and allow the hospitals to only treat COVID-19 patients. Um, the next one is the uh, remote workers and the Wi-Fi devices. So we had a, a huge influx of orders with regards to providing um, connectivity to these remote employees working from home and um, being able to utilize Wi-Fi devices to connect back into the VPN and perform their role responsibilities. Um, virtual care, as I mentioned, telemedicine is now more important now more than ever, especially with our nursing homes and our um, uh, clients that have any type of uh, telemedicine or virtual care options built in. We do provide solutions that allow monitoring of chronic patients from home. We also have um, consulting with those that have or may have coronavirus and uh, they're able to virtually connect with their physician and uh, we have connected peripherals that also play a role and they're able to capture vitals so that it gets back to that um, uh, doctor in order to provide a proper diagnosis. But these are all connected on the first net network. Um, the next two pieces are the clinic uh, clinician shifts. So again, being here in New York, there's been a call out for more healthcare professionals to come forward and assist. We're even having clinicians come out of retirement 
in order to uh, make up for the influx of patients and the overflow within our hospitals and making sure that we're able to account for the connectivity and the communications for those onboarding employees that are playing a, a vital role with regards to this pandemic. And then the last piece is, as I mentioned, the enhanced collaboration and data. So making sure that we've got executive conferencing platforms so that many employees are allowed on a single bridge, increasing call paths to handle the call volumes that are happening uh, with most of our clients, especially in hospitals and again, in these nursing homes. So uh, making sure that we're increasing bandwidth at facilities are all aspects of the overall FirstNet mission and the FirstNet solution when it comes to making sure that our first responders and those that support them are able to communicate during these critical times. So um, I believe that was my final slide. I'd like to pass it over to Donna from CradlePoint. Thank you very much. And thanks for that great overview of FirstNet. Um, and we have been really excited to work with FirstNet um, as we've gone through this period of time. I'm glad that we could help to be a rapid responder and help keep all of our frontline emergency responders connected. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of, of what we've been doing and why both FirstNet and CradlePoint are a great solution for first responders and healthcare workers that are dealing with this. Um, what really matters in an emergency, and this is true whether it's a pandemic or a hurricane um, or other types of emergencies, is speed. Number one, um, you know, you see FEMA rushing out there, you see first responders rushing out there, and they know that it's important to respond quickly. And speed doesn't just refer to the speed of the network, which, um, you know, we talked about how, how nice, how fast FirstNet is. It really re also refers to how quickly you can get a network up. And so um, uh, having a network that you can deploy in hours, I think some of the things Avakar talked about as far as bringing in um, emergency uh, networks if you need to, cell towers on a truck, things like that, really shows how quickly you can get a network up either during this experience or other types of experiences. Um, what matters is scalability. So you can't, um, you can't have just one ops, you can't have one clinic and then another clinic and have to go and configure them all separately. You really need to be able to deploy quickly at scale. Um, if you've got doctors at home trying to do telemedicine, or if you're opening up a lot of testing centers, you need your network and your network connectivity solution to scale. Um, of course, you need um, the ability to integrate and to be able to securely protect data and users. While some of our um, uh, you know, health clinics are, are obviously trying to scramble, that doesn't mean that they can just let go of their security standards. They still have to follow HIPAA standards. They still have to follow data security and privacy standards. And so it's important that your network and your connection remain secure throughout all of this. And of course you need it to be simple. The last thing you wanna do in a tent is um, have to bring in a whole rack and, and load multiple appliances and cable them all together. What you really need is something simple. And I think those ruggedized cases that Abacor showed are, are perfect for that. This idea that you can just bring a network in a case. Um, you don't need an IT staff to set it up. Sometimes you don't even need power. You plug a battery in and you're ready to go. You're connecting to FirstNet. You're on an incredibly reliable high performance network, but you're still preserving all of your uh, security needs. And really what it gives you as our frontline responders is a network that you can depend on. It gives you um, the network and it gives you the ability to connect you, your equipment, your phones, your iPads, um, your computers to that network. So CradlePoint and AT&T FirstNet together have been working very hard to provide quick to deploy all inclusive pop-up networking solutions. And basically, um, if you think about FirstNet, which is the network, um, the towers all the way through the core of the network, taking you to the cloud, taking you to your applications. And you have locations, you have the actual pop-up sites, you have the at-home clinicians, you have the hospitals. Really what CradlePoint does is connect to those two. It provides an edge solution um, that consists of a router and software that allows you to make that connection. Uh, FirstNet's a great network, but you have to be connected to it. And um, of course you can connect to it via phones, if you have a FirstNet ready phone. Um, or iPad, but if you need to connect other equipment, if you need to connect um, a lot of users, then you really do want to have this, this edge solution, this router that would allow you to connect all of your equipment to FirstNet um, within a single location. 
So a couple examples, I think Abacor talked about a couple great ones. Um, we worked with one health provider um, that needed to get 700 temporary healthcare surge tents up and running. So when I say you have to deploy it scale quickly, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about 700 new clinics in just a couple of days. And they needed these to test for viruses, for ER emergency room overflows. Um, and literally they're setting these up in hospital parking lots. And of course, they didn't have an IT staff that could go visit every site. Um, there, was, there was just no way to do that. So what they did is they went with um, Cradle Point and they went with uh, FirstNet. And basically they brought an all-in-one solution in that had built-in Wi-Fi. So that Wi-Fi could be used by all of the health providers and all of the equipment to connect to the network. Um, of course, they wanted to use FirstNet and they needed the security. So they used DMVPN so that they could quickly integrate these sites within their existing network without having to go and change their data center or their applications. And the benefit to them was number one, they knew that their data had priority over non-emergency internet traffic. And that was basically what they received by being an extended primary user on FirstNet. They needed to maintain their, their HIPAA compliance security and they needed their centralized IT staff to be able to manage that. Um, and the bottom line is they needed their professionals to be able to focus on what they were doing and not focus on, you know, am I getting a network signal? Another great example was, um, this was kind of at the beginning of the COVID-19. If you guys remember, there was a cruise ship, one of the first cruise ships where there were people um, infected on it and they needed to get them off the ship. So they brought them into the port of Oakland uh, but this organization needed to receive, document, test, and transport 3,500 passengers, um, including some of whom did have coronavirus. Um, and they needed medical staff, logistics teams. They needed to connect devices, but they also needed to connect patient warm armbands, um, scanners, and other types of things. And basically, they turned to Cradle Point and FirstNet as well. They used a 1700 router, which is a ruggedized router that allowed them to have Wi-Fi access, uh, GPS tracking, again, maintaining security, um, and again, of course, connecting them to FirstNet. And the benefit was they were able to get this pop-up testing facility up in a very short amount of time. Um, they were able to use priority and preemption to ensure that they had uninterrupted connectivity, um, and they were using security to protect highly sensitive data. So that's just two examples of how a combination of Cradle Point and FirstNet really allowed these networks to be brought up quickly, without compromising security and best practices. Um, and really that's, that's one of the things that, that Cradle Point does. We allow you to connect IoT, whether it's security cameras, whether it's emergency signage, uh, we allow you to connect fixed sites, so maybe some of the clinics, um, or we allow you to connect vehicles. And um, that could be an actual vehicle, of course, a police vehicle, an ambulance, a fire truck, uh, but it could also be a mobile command center. So something that moves into a location and acts as a centralized place for connectivity. Um, and the benefit is if you are a diverse organization, if you do have all of these different examples, you can have a single solution that connects all of them and that does it um, in one, one comprehensive platform. So you don't have to worry about how am I gonna manage my signage or my security cameras separate from my vehicles and separate from my command centers and testing locations. So um, really Cradle Point is ideal for larger facilities or mobile clinics. We do have some people using them at home, particularly if they have high security or bandwidth needs, but we really tend to use it in the, the types of examples we talked about, where you're going to have a clinic within a store, maybe a mobile clinic, a fixed clinic, um, some form of a pop-up location where you need an all-in-one network and you don't have some other um, network that you can use. For example, we talked about setting up inside of the Javits Center in New York. Of course, the Javits Center has its own network, um, but that's not necessarily a network that a, that a healthcare company wants to use or a first responder. So with CradlePoint and FirstNet, they're bringing their own network solution in there. And that really gives them that day one connectivity, which is the critical, the critical thing. Um, and if you're in a mobile environment, you can actually mount a cradle point router um, in an ambulance in other types of mobile facilities and that can connect not only the phones and tablets within it of course the medical equipment but it can also connect to the um, vehicle information so that allows you to be looking at where the vehicle is information like speeds um, you know amount of time it's been on the road 
And that can be really helpful in a crisis. Um, one of the most important things in a crisis is to understand how, um, how where the vehicles are located. Uh, you don't want to lose track of where your clinics are, where your vehicles are. And so the ability to integrate with first, uh, the ability to integrate with GPS is really important. Um, now, Critical Point recognizes the importance of our first responders um, and all of these frontline workers. And we actually have a program called First Connect, which you can join if you are any one of those organizations. It's free. It's just part of being a Critical Point customer. And there's some great benefits there. Number one, we do give grant assistance. And I know this is probably not a time people are applying for grants. Um, but you would, in the future, if you want to upgrade your facilities or invest in future disaster preparedness, we will help you apply for a grant for that. We offer training for both the IT and the operational staff. We have priority support access, uh, basically priority and preemption across our support network, um, including a dedicated phone number just for first responders. We'll refer you to installers, people that can help you get up and running. And we do donate a portion of all of our revenue um, to uh, other first responder organizations, um, including, the, in this case, the First Responders Children's Foundation, who we made a donation to in January uh, this year. And the grant assistance program is something I would really encourage everyone to take a look at. Um, like I said, we offer it for free. Uh, it does help pay for hardware, software, training, other types of services. We can help you locate a grant, decide if, you know, help you know whether you qualify. Um, of course, we can't guarantee anything, but we will do everything we can to help you qualify or help you receive the grants that you're qualified for. And with that, I will turn it back over and see if we have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Abakar and Donna. Um, I'm getting a little feedback, but hopefully this sounds okay to everybody listening. Uh, I, we did get some fabulous questions, and I am going to just start with one, which is uh, regarding whether or not we're going to have access to uh, the slides. And yes, we are going to provide a link. It's all been recorded. So um, anybody that's registered is going to going to have access to that. So we, we've received some really great questions. And I'm going to just preempt this by saying, forgive me, I'm going to use the exact acronyms that people sent questions in with, regardless if I know what they are. Hopefully the, the panelists will be able to uh, identify them. So let's, let's talk really quickly. Um, Abakar, if you could just do a, another high level differentiation between the differences between the first net a separate physical core and a virtual core um, that might be provided uh, being carved out of an existing commercial network. What what are the advantages to what FirstNet is versus what some of the other offerings might be? Absolutely. So uh, again, one of those RFP requirements from the federal government was that we were not going to create, to your point, just a virtual uh, environment for our first responders to utilize. A virtual environment basically means that the traffic for that, that user on the network would still be intermingled and in the same uh, pipe as commercial users as well. Eventually, to get to the top of that network tower, as an example, then that user may be moved to a uh, kind of a prioritized service, but the path to get there would still be mixed with commercial users, which creates risk from a security perspective, also slows down the effectiveness, effectiveness of how quickly that that um, that user can actually connect to the network, and again, that connection is compromised. So, on a physically separated core, it's a completely different network. So, FirstNet is essentially a fifth carrier in the United States. When you get a a black FirstNet SIM card, or if it's IoT, a white FirstNet SIM card, that SIM card is what connects that device to the physically separated FirstNet core. Because of the fact that they're on a separate, physically separated core they are not mixed with commercial users at all. So if you picture kind of a house, you have one house where there's a bedroom that's dedicated to public safety. But throughout those hallways and throughout that entire house, they're mixing in with all those other commercial users. In the first net house or in the AT&T scenario, we have a house for our commercial users and a whole nother house for our public safety users. And that way they're never connected together, they're never intermingling, they're never crossing paths with one another. And the security, the redundancy, and the reliability that we're able to offer on a physically separated core is by far more advantageous for our first responders and our first net users 
than being mixed with commercial traffic. Super, thank you so much. Um, Donna, in the context of the mobile and the stationary solutions, can you give an average distance of coverage uh, with the various pieces of hardware that Cradle Point offers? You know what, unfortunately I cannot because it varies on a lot of things, um, including where it's mounted, what the environment's like, and the types of antennas that are being used. Um, if it is a vehicle mounted um, router, um, then you do not have to be within the vehicle to, to access the Wi-Fi. You can, you can range around the vehicle, um, but I don't have a good, I don't have a good average for you. I can, I can, I can just add to that, um, Donna, with those, um, mobile broadband kits, uh, we got a, a, a linear, uh, range of right under a thousand feet. Again, linear meaning wide open spaces, which a lot of these tents uh, have been. Um, in, in more areas, to your point, where you have walls in between and, and where the antenna is located, it obviously varies. But um, you can get a, a thousand linear feet about um, in a wide open space with uh, one of these cradle point kits. Great. Thank you. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, thank you, Abakar. So, um, Abakar, to you, can you talk a little bit about uh, the Band 14 utilization in the context of regular AT&T customers? Um, two points. One, talk about ruthless pre preemption and the 911 calls. Are they preempted? And then another thing I'd like you to just touch on briefly is the cascading benefit to your um, to the average consumer as we build out this uh, exponentially more robust network nationwide. Absolutely. So the uh, first piece is with regards to the uh, preemption. So um, j just to kind of some of the uh, the network algorithms that take place just because of that SIM card. So that black AT and T, uh, that black FirstNet SIM card on a band 14 device will, by default, home that device on the FirstNet band 14 network, and it will utilize AT and T networks whenever that band 14 tower may not be available. But it'll always home first on a band 14 platform. A non FirstNet SIM, meaning like an AT&T commercial SIM, would always home on a commercial network and will look for that band 14 tower second. Um, so, so that's a key differentiator with regards to the cores and kind of how the connection takes place within the network. Now, in terms of the roofless preemption, so the only calls that we do not preempt are 911 calls. So I'm glad that question came up because it is the only type of communication, the only type of call that we do not preempt off the network. So 911 calls will still go through. That being said, any other phone calls, data sessions, text messaging, if we have a situation where there is uh, congestion on the network and we need to create space for first responders to communicate, then we will clear that spectrum or specifically the band 14 spectrum for the use of our first responders. That does not mean that our commercial users or our civilians will not be able to communicate at all because they will be moved to other LTE bands. So we do still have our 4G LTE bands. We've got our uh, even some 3G LTE bands still available. So they will be moved to a lesser technology where they may not have the ability to stream a Netflix movie, but they may still have the ability to make a phone call or send out a text message. Great, thank you so much. And a point that I would like to add is, um, as we develop this network, uh, clearly we are, are reaching areas of this country that um, may have kind of uh, suffered in the coverage area just because of the, um, the actual need and requirement within those areas. But because of the contractual arrangements, there's gonna be a cascading benefit to the general consumer nationwide uh, to the commercial uh, network as well as all of this is getting built out. So it's important to, to recognize that as well. Um, Donna, I did get a question and it is, um, there is an acronym in here. They want to know, is Cradle Point looking to develop an HPUE router for AT&T? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I really can't talk too much about product plans on, on this call. Um, and even okay. if I could, I, I'm not sure that I would know the answer to that. So I, I okay, all right. No, no, no. Yeah, Good I, enough. I, we'll make sure that we get. To, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I do have some early indications. So uh, H, HPU is, is a high power user equipment. Um, first off, it'll it'll have to happen in the form of a router because uh, it's not something that's going to be available uh, on a on a device. It'll burn your face off. 
But uh, HPUE is um, just early indications show by end of year, we should have routers. We're actually uh, looking to trial some of the early um, kind of concepts with our uh, trains and, and kind of that type of uh, industry uh, or manufacturing kind of an area such as trains where we can utilize HPUE devices. But um, what I have seen at, at a high level is that by end of year, and Donna, this is super early, so it's not even fully baked, but I have seen that it, it looks like something by end of year may be happening um, with Cradle Point, for, and it's a massive thing. It's like the size of a table almost. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you, Abakar, again for that technical insight. Um, one, uh, another question for you, Abakar. You did talk about the deployable kits. Can you speak a little bit to what some of the agencies around the country are also doing as far as developing their own uh, mobile deployables, like a mobile interoperable tactical solutions type of a, a vehicle, incorporating the Band 14? Yeah, so, so uh, the kits that I showed on here are, uh, again, uh, main purpose being a data connectivity. Um, again, nothing provides a better experience than, than the Cradle Point routers within these kits because it allows our, our clients to uh, expand their actual network. So if they're trying to connect their own private internet, uh, they're able to do that functionality with our Cradle Points. So um, in terms of kind of a, a rolling kit or, or a mobile uh, situation where they're able to kind of go out on the field and set up their own data connectivity. Uh, that comes in, in many fashions. That kind of would be an ambulance, like um, like Donna mentioned earlier, with regards to a hotspot connectivity. Uh, that could be those kits that I mentioned, which are all compact and mobile and have all the components in a suitcase. And um, essentially, from an interoperability standpoint, that's more over the air. That's more um, our radio paths being interconnected. So. We have different levels of interoperability kits. It could be uh, functions where we are connecting directly to a console, whether it's at a state level or at a municipality level, where we can uh, interconnect all of those different agencies and give them the ability to communicate with each other. So whether it be somebody holding a, a land mobile radio, which is like a physical walkie-talkie, or somebody holding an iPhone, uh, they can still communicate through uh, interoperability. It's all a matter of how that how that functionality is configured, whether it's at a state level, at an agency level, or uh, through the hospital itself. Okay, great. And um, I only have like two more questions that I think we'll be able to get to. Um, one is uh, kind of talking a little bit about that extended primary audience that we have today. Uh, the question did come in specifically about schools. Um, how do you see schools factoring into the extended primary uh, model with FirstNet? Yeah, so uh, we do have specific eligibility available for uh, K-12. through uh, Obviously, uh, they, they played a, a major role with regards to uh, communications and whatnot. Um, not so much for, from an e-learning standpoint. I think that's a, that's a different method, not exactly first met, but more from a uh, connectivity during emergencies, whether it be evacuations or anything that requires school personnel to uh, communicate with our first responders. That's essentially what determines an extended primary user from an eligibility standpoint. It comes down to when do you need to communicate with first responders and are you part of the incident resolution when it comes to an emergency or a crisis? So uh, looking at, at schools and obviously with regards to uh, the worst case scenarios, whether it be a fire or an active, active shooter scenario, uh, any of those personnel and those key administrators that need to be part of the communication bubble uh, are eligible for that extended primary platform. Okay, and Abacar, sorry, you're getting the lion's share of these um, first half of these questions. Um, another question, actually a couple questions have come in as far as what does the FirstNet AT&T uh, do as far as uh, bringing the network into some of these impenetrable buildings? What are the in-building solutions that are available for FirstNet users? Absolutely. So uh, in-building solutions come in, in many shapes and sizes. The, uh, the, the top of the line would be a distributive antenna system or a DAS. And uh, that is something that we will partner with our, with our healthcare clients or with our clients to uh, determine uh, the type of DAS that they will require, whether it be a neutral DAS that allows multiple carriers to connect or whether it be a, uh, a, an AT&T only DAS that will allow for uh, AT&T connectivity within a building. So that's kind of the top of the line and can essentially cover an entire building. Uh, there are other solutions uh, when we're thinking of in-building connectivity. We are actually utilizing what are known as um, as kind of more more compact 
uh, solutions here. Let me get the exact name for us. We're actually utilizing it in the Navy ship that just ported onto uh, New York City. Um, they actually required a, um, a connectivity uh, inside the actual uh, boat and we're using, uh, let's see, cell files. So we're using cell fi uh, connectors. It's uh, similar to a, a Metrosol, which is another solution. A Metrosol gives you about 5,000 square feet within an infrastructure, but a cell fi with the um, additional antennas that we can attach to it can essentially give you up to 15,000 uh, square feet. And these are aspects that we're providing to our clients. Uh, many of these solutions are at no cost at all to the client. So uh, we're, we're very aware of the in-building connectivity needs that are necessary for our clients to utilize FirstNet to its full potential. And we do have various solutions that range anywhere from a metro cell to cover 5,000 square feet, all the way up to a distributive antenna system that'll cover the entire building. Fantastic, thank you. And I think the last question that we'll um, take for the day has to do with the plans that are available for uh, FirstNet users in terms of their families. Uh, I know that AT&T, FirstNet AT&T has expanded uh, access to the families as far as a plan, but can you make sure that everybody's clear on the distinction on that plan and, and where those uh, family members actually go with their SIM card versus where that actual first responder is gonna um, land as far as networks with, with that black SIM? Again, just make that distinction. Abacar, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so yeah, so two parts to that. That's actually known as our subscriber paid program. And that is an available program to all of our users on the FirstNet network. So um, it ranges anywhere from our primary subscriber paid users, which would be, again, those first responders, uh, whether it be police, fire, EMS, or those uh, folks within the trauma center, things of that nature. Uh, they, they qualify for the primary subscriber paid program. But uh, recently, at the, uh, in mid-March, we also announced our extended primary subscriber paid program, which, again, opened up the eligibility for any of those extended primary users, such as IT, such as uh, doctors and nurses within healthcare, to also qualify for FirstNet on their personal paid-for device. So that allows a doctor or a nurse, whether it be at a private uh, practice or whether it be in a hospital, they can actually get FirstNet for their own personal device, and they will still benefit from the priority the preemption, all of those network characteristics, as well as very competitive pricing that's dedicated to our first responders and to our extended primary users as well. In terms of their family members, so um, from a primary standpoint, if it's uh, law enforcement, fire, police, things of that nature, um, they get access to a first responder appreciation offer that's available on the at and consumer side. So that allows their family members to also be on a separate account and gain um, financial benefit on the, on the um, non-FirstNet network, but still provides an economical advantage. And um, for our hospital employees or those extended primary users on FirstNet, there's also um, hospital level IRU discount or individual responsibility user discounts that are afforded from AT&T to their family members as well. So uh, multiple discounts for family members and access to FirstNet on the responder side. Fantastic. And I just want to reiterate that those family members are not getting access to band 14. It is uh, more of an economical uh, benefit and uh, package deal for the first responders and their families. Well, I think Correct. we have come to. Yeah, thank you. I think we've come to the end and uh, we really uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar today and felt that it was time well spent. Uh, we deeply appreciate your participation. And again, we are the Public Safety Broadband Technology Association. And we want to be your advocate for all aspects of FirstNet utilization. Uh, I would encourage you to become a member of our association for $75 a year. You'll help support our efforts to continually bring cutting edge information about FirstNet and all aspects of the ecosystem uh, that is being purpose built to your advantage. So please visit our website to become a member. That's uh, P the PSBTA.org. Um, this concludes our webinar uh, with Cradle Point and FirstNet AT&T on the COVID-19 response, rapidly deployable networks for healthcare. Thank you again for your time. We truly appreciate it.